Thanks for joining the Christian Perspective channel. Don't forget to like, share, subscribe, and turn on the notifications bell so you don't miss a thing. Okay, so now if we look at um, Genesis chapter 42, Jacob sends the ten sons to buy corn in Egypt, but he keeps Benjamin behind. Because he doesn't trust these sons with Benjamin. Benjamin is Joseph's younger brother and the only other uh, natural son from the wife that he truly loved, Rachel. And um, so he keeps Benjamin behind. Benjamin was the youngest of the, all the sons and he didn't really, wasn't too sure about these other sons. So uh, he sent them to Egypt during a famine to buy corn. And Joseph was in Egypt, and he was the ruler, and he recognized them. And he ended up accusing them of being spies. We, we spoke about all this in episode 16, part 2, uh, when we covered uh, Joseph. So Joseph accused them of being spies, and then he demanded that they, they said they had a younger brother, Benjamin, because he was questioning them. And he kept Simon and said, I'm not going to let him go until you go and bring your younger brother and that prove to me that you have a younger brother and then I will let this one go. And so they returned back to Jacob and um, Jacob is like, no, I've lost two sons. And uh, after a while, they, it took a long time, but they ran out of food again. And Jacob sent them back to Egypt to get some more corn. And they tell him, we can't go back without Benjamin. We have to have Benjamin. And Jacob said to them in Genesis chapter 42, verse 36, And Jacob their father said to them, Me you have bereaved of children. Joseph is not, and Simon is not and you will take Benjamin away. All these things are against me. Reuben is the oldest, the firstborn. And Reuben spoke unto his father, saying, Slay my two sons, if I bring him not to thee. Deliver him into my hand, and I will bring him to thee again. So Reuben said, I'll take care of him, and if I don't bring him back, you can kill my two sons. And he said, My son shall not go down with you, for his brother is dead, and he is left alone. If a mischief befalls him in the way of which you go, then you shall bring down my gray hairs with sorrow to the grave. So Jacob still didn't trust him. It's like, yeah, so you, you're, you're putting up your two sons that you're going to bring my son back? And then Judah spoke up to Jacob. This is Genesis chapter 43, verse 3. Judah said to Jacob, The man did solemnly protest to us, saying, You shall not see my face, except your brother is with you. And Judah said to Israel, his father, Remember, Jacob had two names at this time. Jacob, and he had received the name Israel from God. And Judah said to Israel, Send the lad with me, and we will arise and go, that we may live and not die, both we and you, and also our little ones. I will be a surety for him. Of my hand thou shalt require him. If I do not bring him to thee, and set him before thee, then let me bear the blame forever. So Judah is putting his own life as a guarantee that he will bring that Benjamin back from Egypt. Jacob then sent them away. And he gave them all kinds of gifts to bring to Joseph and prayers. And, and he blessed them. So you see, this is another aspect of the man Judah. That Judah was willing to put his own life up to save the family. Reuben was rejected by Jacob because he wasn't willing to put anything up. He was putting up his sons. Judah was putting up himself. So Jacob rejected Reuben. Israel accepted Judah.
You see there's this, these things playing out here that have great implications in their future. This is uh, one of the things that makes the book of Genesis incredibly profound. When Joseph saw them coming back to Egypt, he had a great meal with them. And then we, we saw this again in, in episode 16. And uh, he had this great meal with them and they sent them away. And that's when he put the cup in their, his cup in their uh, packs and accused them again. And he put it in Benjamin's pack. And then uh, he sent his servant to go and get the cup and to take Benjamin this time. And so the servant came and they said, we didn't steal the cup. Whoever's pack it is in, let him die. And the servant said, well, he won't die, but I will take him as a slave back to my master. So they found, he found the cup in Benjamin's pack. And he took Benjamin back to Joseph. And so now they're sitting here and they don't have Benjamin. And they're like, oh no, we can't go back now to our father without Benjamin. After all the trouble we went through to get him to let Benjamin come, you know. So then, here's another, the next thing about Judah. Genesis chapter 44, verse 14 to 34. Then they rent their clothes and laid at every man his ass and returned to the city. And Judah and his brothers came to Joseph's house, for he was yet there, and they fell before him on the ground. And Joseph said to them, What deed is this you have done? Didn't you know that such a man as I can certainly divine? And Judah said, What shall we say unto my Lord? What shall we speak, or how shall we clear ourselves? God has found out the iniquity of thy servants. Behold, we are my Lord's servants, both we and he also, with whom the cup is found. So now Judah is um, he's confessing his sins. God has found our iniquity. We, we are your servants. And Joseph said, God forbid that I should do so, that, but the man in whose hand the cup is found, he shall be my servant. And as for you, get up, in peace and go to your father. Then Judah came to near to him and said, O oh my Lord, let thy servant, I pray thee, speak a word in my Lord's ears, and let not thy anger burn against thy servant, for thou art even as Pharaoh. My Lord asked his servant, saying, Have you a father or a brother? And we said to my Lord, We have a father, an old man, and a child of his old age, a little one, and his brother is dead, and he alone is left of his mother, and his father loves him. And thou said unto thy servants, Bring him down to me, that I may set my eyes upon him. And we said to my lord, The lad cannot leave his father, for if he should leave his father, his father would die. And thou said unto thy servants, Except your youngest brother come down with you, you shall see my face no more. It came to pass, when we came up to thy servant, my father, we told him the words of my Lord. And our father said, Go again, and buy us a little food. And we said, We cannot go down. If our youngest brother be with us, then we will go down, for we may not see the man's face, except our youngest brother be with us. And thy servant, my father, said unto us, you know that my wife bare me two sons. And the one went out from me, and I said, Surely he is torn to pieces, and I saw him not since. And if you take this also from me, and mischief befalls him, you shall bring down my gray hairs with sorrow to the grave. Now therefore, when I come to thy servant, my father, and the lad be not with us, seeing that his life is bound up in the lad's life, it shall come to pass when he sees that the lad is not with us, that he will die, and thy servants shall bring down the gray hairs of thy servant our father with sorrow to the grave. For thy servant became surety for the lad unto my father, saying, If I bring him not to thee, then I shall bear the blame to my father forever. Now therefore I pray thee, let thy servant abide instead of the lad, a bondman unto my Lord. 
and let the lad go up with his brothers, for how shall I go to my father, and the lad be not with me? Lest preadventure I see the evil that shall come on my father. So Judah went to Joseph and he told him the whole story about how he put his life up that Benjamin would return. And he said he can't go back to his father without Benjamin and see him die in grief. And so he offered himself. He said, you keep me as a slave and let the little boy go back to his father. And Joseph knew the whole time he was talking about his father and him being the dead one and talking about his little brother and how much his father loved the little brother. So Joseph, after hearing all this, broke down in tears and revealed himself of who he was. So this is the next great event recorded about Judah, that Judah was willing to give his life for Benjamin. Benjamin is a very important um, character also. Um, I don't think we'll do a whole episode on that, but Benjamin, the Apostle Paul, was of the tribe of Benjamin. Benjamin was a, a, like a, a small group within the Jewish community. Uh, um, Judah and Benjamin were two tribes who were very close. And when Judah broke off from the northern kingdom of Israel, Benjamin became a part of the kingdom of Judah. That's why Jews can also be sons of Benjamin, or they can be sons of Judah. And Simon also was in part of Judah. Because the tribe of Simon is right within the camp of Judah. That's the last act of the man Judah recorded in the Bible, is those three things. When he gave himself, first of all, him having his sons in chapter 38, and then uh, him... Um, convincing his brothers not to kill Joseph, and then him putting his own life on, on, up on behalf of Benjamin twice. And so this is a forerunner of Jesus Christ, putting his own life up on behalf of sinners. So Judah is, taking, is willing to take the fall, but didn't actually have to take it because... Because he was willing to take the fall, he revealed who Joseph is, you see? So Jesus Christ, he was willing to take the fall, and he revealed who Ephraim is, which is the Christian community. So it's how these things all ended up playing out. Okay, in part one, we, uh, we took a look at Genesis chapter 38 and the chart that I made from that chapter showing Judah's uh, wife and his five children, three from his wife and two from his son's widow. Now remember in part one when we talked about Onan making children for his older brother Ur. Because Ur died and left a widow without children, it was Onan's responsibility to give her children. But they would not be Onan's children, they would be Ur's children. Now, Judah made children with Ur's widow, or with Onan's widow. I suppose it would still be Ur's widow. But the point is, is these, ch these are not Judah's children, but they are Judah's children. But they're ha actually his grandchildren, because he provided his son's widow with children. So they would be his son's, his two son's widow's children. There's sort of a bit of a, a prophetic notion there. So now he has the wife and the widow Tamar. The wife is unnamed, and the widow Tamar is named. T 
Tamar. So this first, this wife of Judah would never had a name. It doesn't appear anywhere in the Bible. And what is the significance of that? Well, in prophetic terms, that's the wicked and the righteous. The unnamed is the wicked, and the righteous is named. If we look at Revelation chapter 20, verse 12, we see that that principle right here. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead, which were judged out of those things which were written in the books, according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged, every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Being unnamed is akin to being the wicked. And having your name justified or written in the book is akin to being righteous. And Tamar, remember Tamar, her name means palm tree, which is a literal symbol of the righteous. While Judah's wife was completely unnamed. That's a literal symbol of the wicked. Now, Genesis chapter 38 can be looked upon as like a history of Judaism. Remember I said the, Bible, the book of Genesis is like a table of contents for the Bible. We go right through Judaism and through the first and second coming of Christ in this one chapter. The two twins of Tamar, as we explained in part one, uh, are symbolic of the first and second coming of Christ. And the ones who accept Christ are the children of Tamar which are the righteous. Now remember, if you talk to a rabbi, he's going to disagree with everything I say. But this is a Christian perspective. This is Christian theology. That principle is shown in John chapter 3, verse 36. When Jesus is talking to Nicodemus, He that believeth on the Son has everlasting life, and he that believes not the sun shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides in him. So whoever believes Jesus has life. Whoever does not believe Jesus does not have life. When we look at Judaism and Christianity, um, those who believe Jesus have life. Those who do not, do not have life. So the Jews, many Jews were saved. The first Christians were Jews. The ones who did not believe went on to form modern Judaism. Now when we look at the three children of Judah's wife, if we look at it from pro prophetic terms, there are three stages in the history of Judaism. The first stage uh, we refer to as the first temple period. And it basically includes... Um, Moses leading the, the children of Israel out of the promised land and forming the kingdom of Israel and building a temple. And this is the first temple period. And they were found to be wicked and the temple was destroyed by Babylon in 586 B.C., Solomon's temple. Um, it, we, we don't need to go into all the prophecy and all the, the biblical references for this there's hundreds of them that because they worshiped idols because they kept falling away from the true worship of jehovah he finally gave them up and sent them into captivity and the northern kingdom was completely taken away and never seen again and the southern kingdom of judah was taken away for 70 years and brought back for David's sake because of the promise that God gave to David remember 
that your son shall sit on the throne forever, and Jesus is the son of David who sits on the throne forever. So for David's sake, not for their because they were good, or not because God changed his mind, it was for David's sake they were brought back. And for David's sake means they were brought back in order to bring in the Christ. And after the Christ, then the Romans destroyed the second temple, which was called Herod's temple. Remember, we covered it uh, episode 16. We covered the Edomites. Herod was an Edomite who was forced into Judaism. His, his father was, the Edomites were forced into Judaism and they actually became the ruling class, the royal, the royal class. The second son would then represent the second temple period. Now it's important to understand what happened in the second temple period. The Jews were sent into captivity for 70 years and during that 70 years, they had to find a way to carry on their religion. Their religion was the law of Moses. And they didn't have a temple anymore. And this is where the synagogue was set up. And the, the Pharisees, if you will, they, they set up rules and ways that they could follow the law of Moses as close as possible without having a temple or a priesthood. Uh, now the temple and the priesthood was actually the way they would receive cleansing from sin. They, they lived through the Babylonian captivity under this system. And they came back to rebuild the temple after 70 years. And we can read about this in Ezra chapter 9 and 10. When the Jews returned from Babylonian captivity, one of the very first things they had to deal with was that so many of them had made children with non-Jews. I'll start reading. It just sort of gives you the flavor of what's going on here. Ezra chapter 9. Now when these things were done, the princes came to me, saying, The people of Israel and the priests and the Levites have not separated themselves from the people of the lands, doing according to their abominations, even the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Jebusites, the Ammonites, the Moabites, the Egyptians, and the Amorites. For they have taken of their daughters for themselves and for their sons, so that the holy seed have mingled themselves with the people of those lands. Yea, the hand of the princes and rulers has been chief in this trespass. And when I heard this thing, I rent my garment and my mantle, and plucked off the hair of my head and of my beard, and sat down astonished. Then were assembled unto me every one that trembled at the words of the God of Israel because of the transgressions of those that had been carried away. And I sat astonished until the evening sacrifice. You see, because they, they all gathered together at the rebuilding of Jerusalem and they read the law of Moses and they read, you shall not mingle yourselves with these nations. And they had all done it. They'd been doing it for the last 70 years. So now they don't know what to do. They're, it's their children and their grandchildren that we're talking about. So at the evening sacrifice, I arose up from my heaviness, and having rent my garment and my mantle, I fell upon my knees and spread out my hands unto the Lord my God. And said, O oh my God, I am ashamed and blush to lift up my face to thee, my God, for our iniquities are increased over our head, and our trespass is grown up unto the heavens. Since the days of our fathers have we been in great trespass unto this day, and for our iniquities have we, our kings, our princes, been delivered into the hand of the kings of the lands, to the sword, to captivity, and to spoil, and to confusion of face, as it is this day. 
Now for a little space grace has been showed from the Lord our God to leave us a remnant to escape and give us a nail in his holy place that our God may lighten our eyes and give us a little reviving in our bondage. For we were bondmen, yet our God has not forsaken us in our bondage, but has extended mercy unto us in the sight of the kings of Persia to give us a reviving, to set up the house of our God and to repair the desolations, and to give us a wall in Judah and in Jerusalem. And now, O our God, what shall we say after this? For we have forsaken thy commandments. And he goes on, you know, in great detail. And when Ezra had prayed and when he had confessed, weeping and casting himself down before the house of God, there assembled unto him out of Israel a very great congregation of men and women and children, for the people wept very sore. And Sekaniah, the son of Jehiel, one of the sons of Elam answered and said to Ezra, We have trespassed against our God, and we have taken strange wives of the people of the land. Yet now there is hope in Israel concerning this thing. Now therefore let us make a covenant with our God to put away all the wives, and such as are born of them, according to the counsel of my Lord and of those that tremble at the commandment of our God, and let it be done according to the law. Arise, for this matter belongeth unto thee, and we also will be with thee. Be of good courage, and do it. Then arose Ezra, and made the chief priests, the Levites, and all Israel to swear that they should do according to this word, and they swear. Then Ezra rose up from before the house of God, and went into the chamber of Johanan, the son of Eliashib, and when he came thither, he did eat no bread nor drink water, for he mourned because of the transgression of them that had been carried away. And they made a proclamation throughout Judea and Jerusalem unto all the children of the captivity, that they should gather themselves together unto Jerusalem, and that whosoever would not come within three days, according to the counsel of the princes and the elders, all his substance should be forfeited, and himself separated from the congregation of those that had been carried away. Then all the men of Judah and Benjamin gathered themselves together unto Jerusalem within three days. In the ninth month, blah, 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 blah. The, and Ezra stood up and said to them, You have transgressed and have taken strange wives to increase the trespass of Israel. Now therefore make confession unto the Lord God your fathers, and do his pleasure, and separate yourselves from the people of the land and from the strange wives. Then all the congregation answered and said with a loud voice, As thou had said, so must we do. And then they went on, and they separated themselves from these wives and children. So this was their first great act in, when they came back to rebuild the temple. So Onan was the one who spilled his seed on the ground. And he was found to be wicked, and God slew him also. So that's sort of what I see in this for... Uh, being related to the second temple. Because they never really did carry on with this. They ended up mingling with a lot of other people. They mingled with the Edomites. And the Edomites became the ruling class. The Edomites crucified Jesus Christ. They politically turned the people against the Messiah. So this is how it worked out. This isn't all designed for us to look down upon Jews. This is just the history. And there is a future for Jews. You can point at almost any people and point out these kinds of things. So then uh, when we look at Sheila, that would be the third temple, the third son. He's the one that never died. He's the one that never got the wife. Now, what does a wife represent in prophecy? Everything on earth is a reflection of heaven. So in heaven you have God the Father, 
and he is the God over the people. And the nation of Israel, he, he considered or referred to as like his wife that committed adultery against him. So God is the husband, the church is the wife, and the children are the people in the church. That's, that's sort of what the family represents in prophetic terms. So Judah represents God in this family, and the unnamed wife represents the, uh, the unsanctified um, church, which would be the temple system, which was rejected on behalf of Jesus Christ. Right? Jesus is the true sacrifice, the one sacrifice for all. The temple was only there as a teaching tool. So the first temple was destroyed. The second temple was destroyed by the Romans after um, Christianity was born. Uh, 70 AD, the second temple was destroyed and the Jews were dispersed throughout the nations. And they remained dispersed until 1948 when the nation of Israel, the modern day nation of Israel was formed. And that is also in prophecy, but we'll get to that later. So the third son represents the third stage of Jewish history, the third temple. The third temple has never been built yet. They are working on it. There is a large group of people who are very serious about building it. They have the plans. They have many, many things built. They are very optimistic. And it's, it's only a matter of years they're talking about building the third temple. And this is... Um, a lot of Christians are supporting this as well, but... Biblically, it is a clear rejection of Christ. Because if you accept the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, there's no reason for a third temple. But the Jews, as everybody knows, has rejected Jesus Christ. Um, they don't see him as their Messiah. They see, I guess the way they see it is that they have to build this third temple to bring in the Messiah. So, this is the second coming of Christ, or very much related to it. So, during the birth of Shelah, Judah was at Chezeb, a falsehood, a town called Falsehood. So, Judah was living in a falsehood when Shelah was born. Okay? So then Jacob, the father, says to the church, Tamar, wait uh, until my son grows up. And then I will give him to you. So that's kind of interesting it, because this, this leads into more prophecy about the Jews. And this is a good reason why uh, people should not judge Jews very harshly. They were, um, their rejection was actually a part of God's plan. Their blindness, they were made blind so that we could see. Um, so we can't blame them for being blind, can we? Right? It sort of works that way. So be careful how you judge, especially if you're going to be judging Jews. So there's the first wife, is, is basically the history of Judaism. After the uh, temple was destroyed by the Romans, the second temple, the Jewish um, religion, the, the, the main, mainstream Judaism, uh, became what is known today as Rabbinic Judaism. They have uh, basically two Torahs, 
the written Torah, which is the first five books of the Bible, and the oral Torah, which is the oral teachings of the rabbis. Um, it began with the Babylonian captivity where they started writing the Babylonian Talmud, which is a recording of the oral teachings of the rabbis. And it's been carried forth through even to today. So they have the, the, far, the first five books of the Bible, the, Talmud, the Torah, and then they have the Talmud, the writings of the rabbis. And this is the, um, Jesus Christ spoke very much against the Talmud and very much for the Torah. And this is where they had their, uh, the great disagreement between Jesus and the religious teachers of his time. And then uh, as we, dis we already um, discussed in part one about the two children of Tamar representing uh, Christianity. She is the named woman and the father didn't directly give her a son but indirectly through his dead son's widow which was the Jewish church gave her a son the righteous church, a son was born, which was Jesus Christ. And that was the first coming, and then the second coming will be when he returns in glory from heaven, uh, the rising light as the sunrise. Because he said, just as the sun shines from the east to the west, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. So this is uh, Zara, the rising light who put his hand out first as a prophetic term and then pulled his hand in and then the flesh son was born first and then came the, the uh, prophetic spiritual son. So I hope um, that gives a little, it's, it's a lot of information, but it gives a little bit deeper insight into how profound the book of Genesis really is. And this just goes deeper and deeper. Every chapter goes very deep like this, if you really look into it. Um, but I could be wrong about some of that, but I think it's pretty amazing observations. To me it is. Hopefully you got something out of it. We'll see you in the next part of this episode part three. Thanks for joining the Christian Perspective channel. Don't forget to like, share, subscribe, and turn on the notifications bell so you don't miss a thing.